30 years after Thurman Munson's shocking death in a midseason plane crash, Yankee fans and ex-teammates still mourn the heart and soul of a team that won three pennants and two world titles. Today's guests are the former PR director of the New York Yankees, who has written a splendid new book entitled Munson, The Life and Death of a Yankee Captain. Also, a pitcher who threw to Thurman uh, on the Yankees and then faced him as a Baltimore Oriole. I welcome Marty Appel and Tippy Martinez. Guys, thank you very much for being here. Oh, thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks for having us. You're more than welcome. Uh, uh, Marty, are you surprised at the success of, of this book? Uh, I really am, Tim, because uh, I knew it was a good story that hadn't been told before, but I really thought his his devotees were going to be middle-aged guys in the New York area. I didn't think it was going to resonate nationally, so that was a really pleasant surprise. Why, why do you think it, it's done as well as it has? Well, partly it's the Yankee brand. Sure. I mean, that's they have a following nationally. And he was, uh, you know, he was old school, and people really connected with the way he played baseball. And just the little highlights uh, that you see of videotape, how hard he played and how true he was to the respect of the game. Uh, that was a guy that a lot of people identify with and say, like, this is the guy who played it the way it should be played. He, he had many devotees uh, as far as fans are concerned, but did he have as many devotees on the Yankees? Oh, yeah. In fact, um, you know, famously when Reggie came to the team, um, and did that magazine interview about I'm the straw that stirs the drink, Thurman can only stir it bad. <laughs> Suddenly he had 23 new best friends on that ball club. <laughs> because he was the antithesis of Reggie, right? Yeah, he was the guy who'd been there. He was a player's player. He was already the captain. And here the new guy was like questioning his leadership. And immediately everybody gravitated over to Thurman's side. And, and even Reggie toward the end, right? Oh, they patched things up. In his last year, Reggie flew to Canton at his own expense to appear at a testimonial dinner for Thurman and even flew in his jet with him. Mm-hmm. Tippy, you never flew in Thurman's jet with him. No, never had the pleasure, but uh, I'm sure maybe if I spent more time with the Yankees, I might get a chance to do that. Uh -huh. You were traded in, uh, in 1976 in to Baltimore? With Baltimore. So you and Reggie were teammates with the Orioles, I guess. Yes, huh? Uh -huh. Right. I had the pleasure of being with Reggie for the short moment as well, and I got to know him uh, enough, I guess you might say, but it was quite uh -huh. interesting. It's, uh, this is certainly not a show about Reggie. It's about, uh, really, the book about, about Thurman Munson. Uh, in talking about, talking, about, and talking, about, talking about captains, I, I think you point out that not DiMaggio, not Mantle, not Barra were thought of as captains, but when Steinbrenner took over, of course with DiMaggio, Mantle, and Barra, Steinbrenner wasn't the owner. But when George took over, I guess he felt a need with George's football mentality that we need a captain. Right? A little bit. Now, actually, the position had been retired with the death of Lou Gehrig. Joe McCarthy, Gehrig's manager, had said, uh, with Lou's passing goes the position of captain, it dies with him, there'll never be another one. So now we fast forward to 76, and Mr. Steinbrenner brings up the idea of having a captain. He suggests it to Billy Martin. And he does say, this doesn't always work, and it's not always the guy you think it's going to be, but um, it's something for you to consider. So I was the only guy in the room who remembered this obscure little Joe McCarthy note, mm -hmm. and I brought it up, and I said, you know, not supposed to be another captain. And to his everlasting credit, Mr. Steinbrenner said, well, if Joe McCarthy knew Thurman Munson, he'd know this was the right guy in the right time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a well, great answer. In, in, in 1976, the Yankees, uh, uh, for the first time since 1964, are back in the World Series. They're swept by the Cincinnati Reds. And, and the, the, the famous confrontation of really Johnny Bench and Thurman Munson. Well, it wasn't Bench and Munson in a confrontation, but it was Sparky Evishing praise on Bench, kind of at Thurman's expense. Hmm. And I don't think Sparky intended it to insult Thurman. He was just lavishing praise on Bench, who had just won the MVP in the World Series. And Thurman was like, 
I don't have to sit here and take that. I mean, after getting swept four straight and embarrassed, and I hit 529, and I got to hear that? Mm -hmm. And people in the room were going, what's he talking about? Was it what Sparky said? It wasn't even clear, but it was to Thurman. Was it? Was this the next spring, or was it that immediately That was the after? press conference after the final game. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, and Thurman's reaction was, was very strong. Was he jealous of Bench? Because, I mean, Johnny Bench is the best, no. best catcher ever. Where the jealousy came in was uh, with Carlton Fisk, the rivalry in the American League East. To uh, say that they didn't like one another is an understatement. Right? Yeah, I mean, people think the Yankee-Red Sox rivalry was forever, but it really started when both teams got good in the 70s, mm -hmm. and it kind of the focal point was really those two Rookie of the Year catchers. Thurman in 1970 and then Fisk in 72. Ultimately, he would have saluted Fisk for the career he wound up having. But in the 70s, Thurman was never on the disabled list his entire career, and Fisk was almost all the time in the 70s. Mm -hmm. We will be back to talk more with Tippy Martinez, the, the fine left-hander. Almost say young, because you look like you could still pitch. And Marty Appel. <laughs> and Marty, you look like you could still be a, a PR man. I could still do PR. <laughs> I yeah. think you are. We'll be right back, right after this. Chevrolet's Tim McCarver Show is brought to you by Fact. The day Thurman Munson was buried, you were pitching for the Baltimore Orioles that night against the New York Yankees and against Bobby Mercer in the ninth inning and you threw him a fastball away. Right. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a tough situation. It's um uh I mean we're talking about we're going back thirty years that something's been in my heart for thirty years. And it just so happened Marty and I got together and he wanted to talk to me. And we talked about it and I said, You know, Marty, I've never told anybody this the story and it says you're gonna I says, I guess it's time for me to tell this. And I told him about it, and uh, and that's when you know Mercer came up to the plate, and uh, we got kind of a flashback. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know Munson, if anything, he, he's taught me an awful lot as far as respecting the game and what have you. And uh, uh, I can remember as far as that 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 slight moment when when he taught me as far as with Ronald Floor when we threw him a fastball, and when I threw two curveballs for strikes, and really I could have probably gotten him out with with curveball. And uh, and it kind of froze him for at that moment. That just kind of, you know, just that split second when you're on the mountain. And when I threw Mercer two strikes with curveballs, uh -huh. I wasn't not intentionally from to hit it. I mean, if he if he was looking to hit it, but he had to have been looking breaking ball because uh -huh. I threw two great curveballs for strikes. Uh -huh. And uh, I threw a fastball in the outer part of the. It didn't have to be a strike. I just wanted to throw one fastball in memory of, of Thurman, uh, and I did. And it just so, ho so happened he took it down the left field line, and they won the game. And uh, I believe it was in game of the week. And I just kind of looked up in the air. It was air. a Monday night game. Yeah. Monday night game, yeah. And I looked up in the air because it was, you know, the air was just so thick and heavy. And uh, everybody, I'm sure everybody's hearts were so heavy. And I just looked up in the air and I said, Thurman, that was for you. And you know, they won the game. And um, you know, I don't, I don't want to cry here for the growing up man going back 30 years here, but it was tough. It was a tough moment for me, and I held that in my heart for 30 years until, until Marty came up to me and we talked about it. For Thurman, he thought, I owe Bobby this one fastball. It's not a batting practice pitch. It's a major league fastball. But years before, Thurman had given me the wisdom to respect the game, to let Ron LaFleur have one fastball with a 30-game hitting streak on the line. And he remembered that. In one second, it came back to him. Mercer, if anything, I mean, he's a good hitter, but I had my good breaking ball going. You know how you get that feeling? Sure. And I had threw some, some really good curveballs, and I knew I could get him on another curveball. And just that split moment, that, that second, just kind of brought back that memory. And uh, so, really, the pitch was for him. The, the, the memory also of five, four. We'll be back with Tippy Martinez and Marty Appel right after this. <laughs>